Hello, dear colleagues. Ukrainian Crisis Media Center continues its work with the round table for the theme of modeling of capable community, Ukrainian international experience. The event is supported by Dobre program. Capable communities uh, remains very important issue and widely discussed uh, within our government on how to create high quality uh, network to provide services. And we are curious to know what the consolidated communities think about being capable. And they will report to us on that, and our speakers are Mikola Rybchak, the, the head of the Department for Territorial Development, Barry Reed, director of USA Dobre program, Cesare Trutkovsky, the head of Foundation for Local Democracy Development, Brit Fontenot, Director for Economic Development of the City of Bozman, Montana, USA. Ivan Rubsky, the head of Bashtanska community, and Svetlana Sparjeva, the head of Pakrovska Consolidated Community. I shall remind you that we are online on webpage of Dobre program and on YouTube channel of Ukrainian Crisis Media Sanctuary. Uh, dear speakers, you have 10 minutes for your reports. Please stick to the schedule. And I shall remind to everyone who is listening to us online, you can ask your questions and get the professional responses from our speakers. I give floor to Mikola Rubchak. Mr. Mikola. Over 1,000 consolidated communities have been uh, created in Ukraine, and the plan is to create uh, four or f 500 more communities. It's not a secret that a lot of the communities are not capable. What is the main signal to the ministry from the Ministry of Region to make the communities capable? And what shall the communities do to become ones and how to prevent from the mistakes for the newly consolidated communities. Thank you. I'll wait until my presentation is on your screens. We prepared it with our colleagues and we mention the criteria for you. I am happy to see everyone so the, we started discussing the capability of the communities when we uh, passed the law on voluntary amalgamation of the communities. And when it was passed, and there were a number of requirements that the communities should fit certain criteria, unfortunately. The, our methodology was not duly reflected in this law, and the communities have right to get amalgamated according to the law in the way they feel they should amalgamate in order to improve lives in their communities. Along with that, according to a number of calculations, from one third of the communities, newly amalgamated ones, um, I try to avoid the, the word the word incapable, but I'll say that they uh, cannot be described as those who provide the full set of all the services to their communities. Sometimes the communities didn't consider the requirements uh, that the uh, services provided by the local government should not reduce in quality after they get amalgamated. So, after four years have passed after the amalgamations, according to our calculations, it's 1,002 communities that have been amalgamated by now, and a lot of the uh, communities have gone through elections, and they are working on improving their lives. 
and forming their infrastructure and building relations with the donors and assisting organizations. Some of the communities are waiting for the elections to take place. Some are waiting for the opinions regarding the drug decisions on amalgamations. And this comes this question again, what is uh, the capable community? And in uh, 2018, we laid the first foundation of this term. And we mean that the services should be made available for the citizens within 30 minutes driving time of the emergency services, 20, 25 kilometers of closeness to the center, and the criteria have not always been met. And according to that, according to the requests of the communities and the associations, we have this need. And based upon the analysis of all those uh, communities that have been amalgamated. We made this wise decision. Uh, we came with the average indicator along the Ukraine, and we've taken 30% of cutting criteria on, on the evaluation factors, and we, that's how we uh, resulted in the minimal criteria. And we'll start from the foundations. Who can be the center of the communities? Um, it's, as we say, if you don't know how, how to do it, do it according to the law. So who should be the administrative centers of the communities? The uh, cities of oblast uh, level and the cities that are known as the rayon centers, and we have around 150 cities of the oblast level, around 500 cities on the, on the whole. There are former rayon centers who have the authorities, who have infrastructure and capacities to provide relevant services, and they can be the centers of the communities if they fall out of the influence area of the first two criteria within the 25 kilometers regarding the distances or quality of roads. And other uh, towns that have 20, uh, 250 school students and relevant infrastructure which can be used and uh, re the relevant units that should uh, provide the basic functioning. When we evaluate the uh, current status of the communities, we have proposed in the budget in view of those communities that have been amalgamated, uh, uh, 790 uh, communities should get interrupted in uh, budget relations. According to the budget that has been recently approved, Uh, the number is 872 communities, why 20, 25 kilometers? That's uh, the time the fire uh, department needs to make it to the burning house. And the evaluation, the, the guidance is a guidance we introduced two types of criteria, the so-called cutting criteria, like if uh, they don't have anything like that, we cannot consider this as a community. 
how historically collective farms have been formed. They uh, just use the available land and some mining settlements and other monofunctional territories that could be settled anywhere. And this is particular effect for Lugansk, Donetsk, Lviv, and Lutsk, Volyn Oblast. So they have some, some distant settlements. So we want to prevent from having enclaves and exclaims and the uh, breaks in the territories. And people should not choose two or more local governments functioning on the same level. What's happening in these Matryoshka towns right now, where uh, citizens of Tavrivska community uh, um, elect Tavrivska, Kachovska local councils and so on. This should not happen. And there is plan to introduce this draft legislation to resolve this issue of Matryoshka towns. This applies to Kherson Oblast, right, but this is peculiar to all Ukraine. Then 250 uh, children of school and preschool age. Who do we do it for? We have children, which means that the community has been developing. This means that they have jobs in the communities and uh, there should be school. And we've been forming the uh, base schools and they have to provide for the resources for school buses for transporting the children and efficient material and technical base for the schools. There should be um, classes for physics, for chemistry, for computers and the kids. So the school should have resources and the school should have kids. If they don't have this resource, we suggest that the resource should be made available. The next set of criteria is uh, our evaluation criteria. There are a number of uh, circumstances and we've been commented that uh, the ministry uh, does all sorts of calculations and has discrepancies. The number of population in our methodology, we suggest that uh, uh, lower than 3,000 is low capacity and 6, 000, over 6,000 is high capacity. The uh, uh, space below 200 kilometers is not enough and we base our calculations on the land tax, which is one of the main sources of local budgets. And from 400 kilometers provides uh, good capacity. The in index of tax paying ability has been widely discussed. And the proportion between the average Ukrainian individual income tax, uh, which is evaluated of uh, 2,500,000 rinas for the next year. Uh, if compared with the uh, uh, amounts of individual income taxes paid with the community. And we should come up with the uh, proportion of 1.9. And we have to take into account, which we try to do, that there are big communities with high population and to support them, the uh, uh, ratios on um, tax paying ability and paying and buying power can be reduced. Whereas for the smaller communities where we have two or three rural councils that were donors of the rayon budgets and they are cutting sort of the they're taking the uh, revenues to themselves. They become super capable. So what shall they do? Uh, the uh, uh, communities with lower cap capability should add territory and the communities with high 
uh, capability, they should use this uh, responsible approach that they have to be responsible for development, not just their communities, but the surrounding territories. I would like to give floor to Barry Reed. Mr. Barry, tell us how Dobre uh, program measures the uh, municipal capacity index and what are the approaches to improve the capacity index and how this correlates with uh, the uh, recommendations of the Minister of Region. Thank you, Irina. Um, first, I want to say I love Mikola. <laughs> I love uh, the ministry. Lilia is one of my favorite people in Kyiv. However, <laughs> uh, I disagree with you. <clears throat> so, um, but it's a uh, it's a good time to be talking about um, capability. Uh, we now have some experience in the system. Uh, we're beginning to have some idea about uh, what communities are, what they're what they're doing, how they're doing. Uh, so, first I want to talk about, you know, the need to finish the amalgamation process, whether voluntary or mandatory, it needs to be finished. It needs to be finished before the local elections. I think everybody, almost everybody agrees with that. Uh, our recommendation first would be to concentrate on unamalgamated territory currently existing. So if you're, not, if you're a village or a settlement not in an amalgamated community, you know, you should either form one or join an existing one. Uh, and we think that should be the principle that is based, uh, that the mandatory amalgamation is based on. Uh, we do not think you should take an existing hermata and force them to join another existing hermata or, uh, or a village or settlement and move the center. Um, we, we certainly disagree with that. Uh, these communities volunteered to be a part of this process. You cannot f da now say, sorry, you can't be part of that process. You have to be part of a different process. I'm sorry, we, y if you do that, you will kill this process because the people who should be advocates for this process, you will make enemies. And that doesn't help the system going forward. So, you know, that's our, that's our uh, advice on mandatory amalgamation. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about the principles of uh, measuring capacity, okay? You know, from our perspective, and I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get these in Ukrainian, it's my fault. Um, you know, capability is based on performance, accomplishment, and ability, okay? Those are the key uh, standards for which you should be able to build a system out of what is a capable community and what is not a capable community, okay? Um, and, and going through the criteria that are existing, that are existing at the moment, uh, population is not a measure of capability. Uh, it might be, but it's not necessarily, because I know some communities that are very small that have a lot of money, I'll tell you, they're capable. Uh, and then there are some communities, larger communities, that I would say might not be capable because they don't have enough resources or whatever. Um, the reality is we don't know what a capable community is, really, but that's something we need to talk about. Uh, again, likewise, number of school children, number of kindergarten children, these are not measures of capability. Now, uh, they may speak to optimization of the system, but they're actually not measures of capability because, for example, what if a community uh, only has 170 uh, school children, but they have enough money to have a hub school, to have a physics lab, to have everything? I mean, all of a sudden, how can you say they're not capable if they're providing everything that they're supposed to provide? Um, and then likewise, uh, the geographic features, distance from the center, et cetera, et cetera. Again, none of these are about capability. Sorry, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> um, uh, you know, 
uh, had these been the rules from the beginning, uh, that would be one issue. But now we have five years of experience where we didn't use these rules. So uh, we would argue you can't all of a sudden now use these rules for communities that have been existing for five years. Uh, and then uh, on, you also need to measure both revenue side, but you also need to measure this expenditure side. Because you don't know if a community has enough revenue unless you also look at do they have enough, uh, or do they have enough revenue to meet what expenditures they have. So there has to be, you can't only look at the revenue side, which is what's traditionally been done. When we look at these communities, we say, how much money do they have, or how much money are they getting in their subvention, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you say, oh, because they're getting this amount, then they're not capable, but we don't know that. Maybe they, that's enough money to do what they're supposed to do. And so, um, besides the fact that I would say that the two measures that, that are being talked about at the moment, the local government has no authority over generating that money. That money, the rules are set by somebody else at the center. The, rule, the collection is done by somebody else. Uh, enforcement is done by somebody else. So, you know, uh, the Hermata are at a severe disadvantage if these are the only methods you're talking about for uh, permission capability. And then finally, I just want to say time is also an issue. I, I do really want to guard against coming up with a bunch of capability here are the, here's how we're going to measure capability, and then saying tomorrow, who meets them and who doesn't? I mean, a hermata has to be given time, particularly in this system, this is a new system, they have to be given time to be able to, 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 uh, to either meet those criteria or not meet those criteria. Anyway, I do want to talk a little bit briefly about uh, what, uh, what Dobre program is doing. Uh, we have uh, an index that measures capability, uh, so we have some idea about uh, capacity about, uh, in terms of the ability, in terms of what's happening now. Uh, we're able to measure it. Uh, we have uh, four categories. There are five subcategories, and it's fairly comprehensive. Um, and I can show you that now we have three years of data for some of our communities. And you can see that there is progress. There's progress uh, by the individual uh, components and then overall as well. Uh, so, you know, from the Dobre standpoint, we can see that, in fact, capability is rising. Uh, and we can document that. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to say that the, the other thing that the system lacks is our, our performance indicators. And they do not exist at the moment. Uh, we are willing to work with the government to create them, and we've, we've sent that to the government. Uh, but, you know, being able to set out indicators of actual uh, performance to show in each of the own competencies of each ramada, to be able to develop some indicators to be able to see are they actually performing? Are they meeting either benchmarks or certain targets? And so, you know, that data does not exist at the moment in this system. So to be able to point to capability uh, without this I think is, is a huge issue for the system. Uh, and then, and finally, I just want to make a point because I think Britt's going to talk about this, but on local economic development, there, need, there also needs to be clear capability to promote development in the community. Um, you know, what steps they are. Okay, yeah, one second. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and Britt's going to talk about that, but just the conclusions, I just want to say, uh, Ukraine needs to complete the territorial reorganization the mandatory phase really should only deal with unamalgamated territory unless they're joining to existing. You should not take apart an existing hermata and move it around. I think there needs to be a kind of a broad multi-stakeholder effort to define what capability is going forward. Uh, and then amalgamated communities need to be given time to uh, function and meet those capability requirements once they're established. So, and that's our stand from the Dobre community. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Mr. Cesari Dudkowski, I have a question to you. 
you are an expert who closely cooperates with Ukraine and you know about the approaches used by Ukraine in defining the capability. Uh, can you tell us if the Ukrainian experience can be applied in Poland and what are the approaches of Poland, how they define capable communities and what Poland has to share with our colleagues today? Hello. Uh, uh, this is really a tricky question, if the Ukrainian experience can be applied in Poland. I never thought of, of it. Uh, let me just uh, uh, give you some my perspective on, uh, on the uh, amalgamation process and the process of decentralization reform in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, because in, from the European perspective it is quite unique. I mean, there are very few examples of the uh, amalgamation that goes from the uh, in the direction bottom up usually when we look at the at the reforms in the in the other european countries it is usually compulsory amalgamation we have seen it in uh, many countries as a matter of fact in last 20 years the number of municipalities in Europe has decreased in some countries quite substantially. When you can point out to Greece where this was the 94% decrease in the number of municipalities. Or Belgium, for example, when there was 75% of, uh, of decrease. So the, the overall number of municipalities in Europe is decreasing and there are different reasons for that. Uh, when you think about the amalgamation reforms and uh, decentralization reforms, really, you can think about three major issues related to those reforms. First is economic efficiency, the second is managerial impact, and the second is democratic outcomes. And when uh, I was asked to think about the uh, criteria for establishing capable municipality, this was what came to my mind. I mean, what, what goals we are talking really about. If this is economic efficiency, then uh, let me quote um, one researcher who wrote, over the last 50 years, a wave of municipal mergers has swept the developed world. From Scandinavia to New Zealand, reform has have redrawn the map of local government, combining small units into the larger ones. Reformers had several objectives, including reforming democracy and building a local government capacity, but the main motivation was economy, economic efficiency. And uh, there are no clear research that indicates that amalgamation always leads to the, economic the, the rise of economic efficiency. Uh, there is, of course, some degree of the economies of scale, but I, don't, I think we are, this is not the case of Ukraine, because the research shows that the economy of scale starts with 25,000 inhabitants, okay, and it goes up to uh, 250,000, where above this level of 250,000, you can see th these economies of scale. So the bureaucracy grows so much that it consumes more resources. But below 25,000, the uh, economies of scales are hardly noticeable. Uh, of course, with amalgamation, you can see the, uh, the, um, the increase of managerial costs, but also you can see some positive um, results. But I agree with what Barry said. Population size is a very imperfect measure for the uh, production, uh, productivity cost. So, uh, uh, one issue when we look at the, at the decentralization process would be to look at, 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 at this process from the perspective of economy. The second, uh, the second issue that comes out to my, to, from the research is the managerial impacts. With amalgamation, as I said, there is a growing uh, issue of bureaucracy and, and bureaucratic cost. But on the other hand, the argument is that the increase in size can lead to more diverse and specialized set of services. It means with growing uh, um, uh, administrative apparatus, you can see some more specialization and some room for uh, including more, more specialized services 
like uh, uh, spatial planning, like public transportation, police, fire services, and uh, investment in infrastructure. This can be dealt in a more efficient way with the larger uh, administration. But uh, studies that investigate the in implication of amalgamations for the quality of local service delivery offer some support uh, that for the idea that the larger municipalities can provide better quality of services to citizens. Uh, however, uh, there are so, also some disadvantages. Of course, we, with the larger municipalities, we can talk about wide, wider range of, of tasks that are, that are available. But in smaller units, it is more difficult to specialize tasks, of course. And we have to think about the threshold. W what would we mean when we talk about smaller or larger units? We, if you are uh, indicating the, the indicator of two, 250 uh, uh, pupils in the school, then if we are, uh, assume that 20% of children in a, in a population, we are talking about 3,000 inhabitants. This is not economy of scale. This is hardly uh, the, the unit can, that can support uh, their own uh, provision of services. In uh, small units, the markets for some services may be too small, and uh, the research shows that the 3,000 of inhabitants is a uh, is a small, uh, uh, small market for the provision of, of services. So research findings suggest that improving service quality through mergers comes at the price. Uh, an increase in an average size of local governments enhances the ability to deliver more diverse and better quality services to citizens, to citizens but this enhances local government bureaucracies are more costly uh, to run. And there is a third dimension of um, decentralization reform. The third dimension is, is democratic outcomes. And democratic um, outcomes uh, are clearly investigated and uh, researched in the, and they are related to the size of, um, of a basic unit. Of course, with the larger unit, you can see the unavoidable, unavoidable outcomes of uh, such a re reforms and the trade off. Of, uh, between the efficiency and democracy. Of course, with a larger unit, you can receive more uh, positive economic outcomes, but the distance between the citizen and the administration is uh, becoming uh, more, more distant. In smaller municipalities, close contact between councillors and citizens is more likely, uh, and politicians are more accountable. They are more visible. The, the operation of the municipality can be more transparent. But at the same time, with the, amal with the amalgamation, in, which means growing size of the municipality, the, uh, you, what can be observed in the research in many countries is the decline of community and social trust, and then in turn the decline in the political uh, trust. So local democracy seems to function better in small municipalities, but small self-government also mean a decrease in the competitiveness of elections, which is one of the foundation of democracy. All what I've said uh, is based on the research conducted in several countries in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but I have to underline one Pan thing, uh, that this, uh, these studies were conducted uh, mostly in cases of compulsory amalgamation. There is very, very little research about the cases of voluntary amalgamation. So the, my question is uh, that, uh, uh, that I always pose myself when I look at the Ukrainian uh, example, is what is the ultimate goal of the decentralization reform? I mean, of course, I'm very favorable in, in, in terms of the amalgamation in Ukraine. I'm very happy that the centralization is going on, that we can see the, the growing potential in the local communities. But I can hardly uh, define the ultimate goal of this reform. Do you want to achieve more efficiency, better democracy, or better uh, service provision at the, uh, at the local level? And last but not least, what I want to say is uh, I strongly support what Barry said about the, the further steps of the amalgamation. Uh, I just want to remind you of uh, 
one provision of the European Charter for Local Self-Government, mainly Article 4, uh, Article 5, I say, that says changes in local authority boundaries shall not be made without prior consultation of the local communities concerned, possibly by means of referendum where it is permitted by the statute. And uh, uh, if you have started the amalgamation reform and you have allowed many communities to amalgamate and many people, many organizations have invested resources in building their capacities, uh, in creation their, their, their uh, local identity, now uh, to change it and to say you have to do it in that other process is to throwing the baby out of the bath. Thank you very much. Mr. Rupski, we know uh, from the mass media and uh, on the basis of communication with you, your community fits all the criteria of capability. Dobra criteria and Ministry of Region criteria. <coughs> and is, is a member of the associations, you have to be there for other communities to support them. Please share your experience, uh, how you become capable. First of all, I would like to say that we have to finalize this reform, and it's clear and obvious. The, the more we delay things, the more the amalgamated communities uh, are disadvantaged because they only have the, uh, those communities that haven't been amalgamated yet, they don't have the social responsibility, they only pay for the management, and they seem to be in a better position you know, if they are compared with us, and uh, people remain unhappy. So we have to finish this process. Regarding our association, we have to discuss this. We uh, cooperate with the association of uh, the, the uh, Polish communities, and we talk to the uh, highly efficient and skilled specialists, and they consult us. <coughs> and they pass all the relevant legislation in uh, consultation with the association, which we like. I liked very much the uh, uh, what Barry Reed has mentioned, because he is in Ukraine for a while and he sees our problems. And this population, you know, that it's not really an issue. I understand that this uh, 20,000 number is the optimum, as my Polish colleague has mentioned. And we have communities that only have 3,000 population, and they have 250 uh, school students, but they cannot and some of them cannot maintain the schools, and some of them can, because they have the resource. And when they have the resource, they can do things, and they can welcome uh, kids from other communities. So we have to install some benchmark and to use that. Regarding the uh, uh, smaller schools are concerned, that there, there are a number of really weak schools in Ukraine. In Bashtanka, we uh, spend 13,000 per uh, school student, and they're doing fine. And there are some smaller schools where we spend over 50,000, and they are doing very poorly. I can see on the screen the shell shell. Regarding our community, we have 22,000 population, which is the, the best number for capability, and we have the strategic development plan for the communities. We have social and economic development plan. We have the program from small and medium business development. We have investment passport of the community. 
and local economic development plan. These are our strategic documents that help us develop. On the picture on the left, you can see our strategic unit, one of the best and our oldest. We can attract investments. And the first thing we did, we established that investment unit. And thanks to Dobra program, we have this beautiful room for online voting. Our community is unique. We have the brand Slavia, or a cheese factory, which is the biggest cheese uh, factory in Ukraine. We have uh, gardens, and we have four markets for our small town. And we were setting them uh, for uh, on purpose, and it took us a while. I'm uh, been in my position for 33 years, and we did that on purpose in uh, mid 90s to promote development of medium class, which resulted in uh, a number of uh, small businesses in our community. We have the zoning plan and plan of Dobre village which is the most prospective village in our communities. We have railway there and 35 kilometers of gas and water supply. The land, we have this problem with our assets. We were very happy when we were allocated 10,000 hectares of land and 10 more thousand were not given to us. But those that we have been given, we are very happy to have it. We have signed agreements for 45, for 49 years. And this limits our uh, possibility to work with the land. We want to block those uh, agreements. We visited Poland many times. We saw how the industrial parks are working there and how the industrial parks in Canada are doing. And we've been trying to make something uh, of this sort. And we've allocated 140 hectares of land for that. And that seems to be it. We need to promote that. We need to further get the support from the uh, Ministry of Region. And this will help us create new jobs and produce other economic effects. The economies have been working nicely due to industrial parks in Poland, we want to have something like that in our community too. <clears throat> this is one of our uh, uh, projects done jointly with Dobre. Uh, we do uh, market and trade territory and we plan to build uh, the administrative service center. So far we don't have the uh, uh, building yet. So we've made a uh, design as the first step. And uh, we want to establish consultant center for our businesses. We developed our logo, which is recognizable thanks to Dobre. Also Dobre financed our video that promotes us for the investors. Jointly with Dobra, we implemented Biker Festival, Chupacabra, and we finance it ourselves now, and it's getting bigger, and this attracts uh, funds to our community. We develop tourism. We have some historical figures. Uh, uh, the artist Grigory Davzhenko is very famous. He is from our community, and we want to make a gallery. And this will pro promote the green tourism. Uh, look at the number of uh, equipment we procured for our communities. It's uh, basically uh, more than we were able to procure for the previous 50 years. And the uh, quality of roads um, slows down this process, and we 
wait until we are given uh, the right to maintain the roads and we procured uh, the equipment for that. This is our social uh, sphere and uh, thanks to our government we have infrastructural subvention <coughs> and money coming from the economic development um, fund and we renovate our schools and sites we introduce participatory budgeting and we were able to implement over 300 projects with that and we want to make Bashtanka the uh, place of sports we plan uh, to reconstruct the stadium and swimming pool and fighters club and establish a communal company to transport passengers because we have no roads we have problems with transporting kids to schools we have buses but we don't have roads so we'll be making a communal company this year to provide basic services for our people we travel a lot and inspire ourselves with these ideas from all, all over the world, we visited uh, Poland, Canada, Sweden, Slovenia. We cooperate with GIZ. We accept a lot of delegations. And uh, Veselivska community is one of the few uh, communities that uh, retain the communal company and uh, they are doing good. So thank you for your attention. That was in short about our community. And there are many ways uh, how to make our communities capable and we use them and try our best. Thank you. Uh, your economic activities are really impressive and thank you for these uh, cases. And I give floor to our next speaker, Dobre program. You might agree with us. Um, delegates <clears throat> sends a lot of uh, local mayors to the states and where you learn and you get infected with this bright virus of uh, local of the community development and um, you impress us with your commitment to implement that in your community mr Britt, we have seen the video from your uh, city the number of businesses there how organically you implement the projects like your citizens are wearing the uh, textiles that are manufactured on your territories how they how you use the the natural conditions you have in your community I am really curious, like all of us, to hear your experience, <clears throat> including our colleagues who listen to us online, and we have wide audience, and so that we can uh, use your experience here in Ukraine. Well, thank you all very much for hosting me here in Kiev, Ukraine. It's my first time to your lovely country, and I feel very welcomed, and I appreciate all of the, uh, the warmth that I felt here, even on the chilly days. So thank you. Um, let's see. So first, I would like to just explain where my city is located in the United States. Uh, it's not a very well-known community, um, although it is growing one of the fastest growing communities under 50,000 residents in America. Let's see. So the reason I have this image here is to demonstrate the importance of being connected, connected to other communities, uh, connected to the world. Uh, so our small airport in Bozeman, Montana, is connected to 17 uh, or 18 different destinations so that our community members can move around. Um, has anyone in the room heard of Yellowstone National Park? Yeah? Okay. Um, has anyone ever been to Yellowstone National Park? Okay. So 
the reason I, I bring up Yellowstone is because uh, it is about 80 miles from, uh, which is approximately 129 kilometers from, from Bozeman. Bozeman likes to claim it, uh, itself as the gateway to Yellowstone National Park, the world's first national park, I might add. Um, so Bozeman have a, has a population of around 50,000 residents, as I mentioned. Uh, our community was born around 1860 as an agricultural hub, supplying miners and soldiers with flour and beef. Uh, today, tourism and the retail trade make up two elements that are important to our local economy. In 2018, 650 million US dollars were spent by non-resident tourists alone in our county, in our small county. The real economic engine, however, for long-term sustainability is our university, Montana State University. Education is critical to economic development. Our presence, uh, MSU or Montana State's presence in Bozeman allows our community to cultivate, among other things, high growth and high wage uh, jobs and sectors like photonics and optics, high tech manufacturing, bioscience, software and technology, and the outdoor industry and finally healthcare. All of these sectors are growing rapidly in our community. And the Bozeman International Airport, the one here, has direct flights to 18 different hubs around the country with international flights, so we're connecting to international flights all over the world. Um, so in addition to the strongest micropolitan economy in the United States, uh, for the last two years, Bozeman leads Montana in uh, into the 21st century in terms of job growth. Okay, so sometimes the essence of a good strategy lies in what, what not to do as opposed to what you should be doing. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about my example of uh, how we learned what not to do uh, is as important as what you should do. Um, my examples here are from our national parks. Um, do not feed the bears. Do not touch the bears. Uh, do not get close to the bears. <laughs> Um, and so, so what you're not supposed to do is, is much more important. So my simple formula is clarity plus focus equals results. Okay. So in 2009, our community had its first plan. And I appreciate uh, hearing about uh, having economic development plans and other plans. Um, they're only as useful if you pull them off the shelf and, and, and actually implement them. So, it's, um, so what I want to talk about today is uh, clarity plus focus equals results in terms of implementing our plan. This was a bad plan. It was 131 pages long. It had unmeasurable objectives. The language was very fuzzy. In other words, it was um, used phrases like support or um, uh, support or, you know, other things, cajole, um, you know, anything but, but sort of hard, actionable um, type, of, uh, type of language. It had minimal clarity, minimal focus, and minimal results were the outcome. This was back in 2009. So in 2016, we really decided to take a new approach where we chose to um, to be clear, have focus, and we, and we got some good results out of it. This particular plan, 43 pages long, so two-thirds more focused than our plan in 2009. It's a three to five-year strategy, depending on, on uh, how things are going. Uh, sometimes you can't predict the how, where the economies uh, are going up and down. Um, it was a document that was telegraphing what the city was not going to do as much as it was saying what we are going to do. And that's a really important point because lo oftentimes local governments are asked to do a lot for, every, for a lot of different people, a lot of different interest groups. So we went, uh, so our sharp focus lies in three areas. Infrastructure investments will drive our economic development. Infrastructure, education and workforce development was a second priority. And thirdly, prioritizing local businesses while continuing to be welcoming to, to, to new businesses who are interested in our community. So 
So clarity, I would suggest, is more valuable than anything else. And I'm using images uh, of the outdoors purposefully because Bozeman is a, is a hub of outdoor pursuits, including uh, skiing and biking and mountain climbing and rock climbing and ice climbing and all kinds of different activities. And so clarity is more valuable than any, anything else. So the clarity part for our plan was to invest in infrastructure, support education and workforce development. Uh, these initiatives uh, would provide uh, our businesses with a 21st century workforce. And then finally, um, supporting our local businesses because our idea was, was that local businesses have chosen to remain in our community despite the economic ups and downs uh, of these cycles. Um, and so those are the businesses that we wanted to, to identify and support um, as much as possible. They weren't going to be leaving, they would only be growing. And so focus is only possible when you have clarity. Of the three areas that I mentioned, um, we decided to focus on urban renewal, in terms of infrastructure, urban renewal, high speed, high capacity, redundant, cost effective fiber optic connectivity, transportation, and quality of life amenities. And I heard some of those mentioned up here today. In terms of education and workforce development, we were going to focus on STEM or STEAM, depending on who you talk to, um, STEM type of education. Montana State University is our four-year education institution, and Gallatin College is our two-year, our community college, and we, we want to support those type of educational uh, efforts. And then finally, sector and cluster development. And then under uh, the focus under supporting local business was to build a coalition of economic development uh, organizations, actively advocate on behalf of our local businesses, and then finally engage and wel welcome the new ones. And then results are, the, are really the positive outcome of clarity and focus. And so briefly, I will just run through some of our results from using this strategy. $132 million in investments in our urban renewal districts, $25 million investments, planned investments in our transportation infrastructure, construction of the $10 million sports park in our community uh, to support those types of, of efforts, investments made to increase STEM learning, aligning our four-year and two-year educational uh, workforce opportunities, creating the Montana Photonics Industry Alliance, High Tech Business Alliance, and the Greater Gallatin Valley Manufacturing Partnership. And then finally, our city serves as a convener uh, and really um, creates opportunity for dialogue and discussion uh, for our coalition of local economic development organizations. And we've have, we also have financial support from our Big Sky Trust Fund, and uh, that's at the state level, and our local revolving loan fund. So financial opportunities. And then lastly, we were, with using these strategies, we were able to rewrite our narrative. We tell our own story. We don't let someone else write our story for us. We write it, and then we tell it. And so I mentioned earlier, Bozeman was a, um, uh, really was um, a supplier for the miners and the soldiers of a, of a local fort uh, uh, by supplying flour and beef. Well, we have been agricultural for many decades, but now we're known as a tech town, a booming technology hub uh, across the state and across the Northwest. So we took our narrative, we changed it, and we rewrote it in a way that is uh, more of a 21st century story. Uh, and I think that is getting a lot of attention across the country. These are my contact details. If uh, you're interested in talking more about, uh, about what we did in our town, I'd be happy to meet you after our presentation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Breed. I know that you are in Ukraine to participate in a conference that takes place tomorrow, and it's organized by Dobre, and it's a conference about strategic development and investment. And I am sure that uh, our Ukrainian colleagues will uh, talk a lot to you, and they would like to, to learn more. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. 
Svetlana Anatolievna, you have this beautiful opportunity today, apart from mentioning the cases of economic development in your community and how this influences the improving the capacity, you can summarize uh, all the previous speakers as, I, as you've listened to them and come up with your own recommendations, both the Minister of Region and experts and yourselves. First of all, I would like to thank uh, our government that during the recent month we've been develop we've been considering that issue, uh, the, this how to evaluate the capability of our communities. And the goal of decentralization is to provide a higher quality services and make them more available for the citizens. And let's acknowledge this that from the process of decentralization that started back four years ago, uh, the process of local de governments development got initiated. And we were happy to be given the opportunities and be one of the 25 communities that are part of the first cohort of Dobre uh, program. And this enabled us to learn, to learn to develop local governance. And while I was listening to the speakers, I can acknowledge that we do not have that strict criteria uh, how to evaluate the capability of the community. Yes, we have the population number and number of school students, and we can have the revenues, but still remain uncapable. Probably because in Ukraine we do not have so far transparent and clear rules of the game among local governments. No strict distribution of authorities between central and local governments. And the process that got started, the decentralization process and the issue of capabilities of the communities, is something to be jointly elaborated. And I will not repeat what has been said by my colleague from Bashtanka community, but you know, indeed, we do not talk about the tax base, we do not talk about how the community should be made more attractive. And when the community is attractive, we will have kids, jobs, businesses and the communities will be capable. We mentioned businesses and we mentioned this option of reformatting, of reamalgamating or something like that. And I believe that we should not do anything like that because the communities that have been amalgamated are capable. Why am I saying that? After the government presented the new program of administrative and territorial uh, arrangements, we set it as a task to make the passports of capacity of the communities, which we have done. And as a result, we could see that the communities below 3,000 of population, smaller number of school students, many of them are medium and high capable, which tells us that when you have the responsibility, when you are committed, you can provide high quality of services. And we have a lot of things to work on. And thank you for inviting us, for engaging us to the discussions. And our purpose of becoming part of the association is uh, to have our voice heard, to make difference and to be part of the strong country as we are 
Of course, we can share our uh, our uh, experiences, and as a result of that, we can come up with high quality documents and criteria that should be uh, of good quality. Thank you. And I would like to thank the speakers for presentation, and now it's uh, discussion time. <coughs> Hello, the SKL project. I have two questions. First, why, when uh, you developed such criteria, you call them the uh, capability criteria, not the something like administrative framework criteria because that would be more more adequate because the capability is about leadership whether the leaders are there about the creativity uh, about good coordination of efforts and that's what creates the uh, capability not the quantity indicators and democracy indicator, what uh, Mr. Expert mentioned, because without having this democracy in place, it will be another administrative unit uh, repeating the previous arrangements. And I think there are uh, very formal indicators that can make the um, decentralization reform get stuck. And uh, uh, make it worse for the already existing amalgamated communities. And when you talk about schools, why don't you consider that uh, according to the education reform, the high schools will be divested from the uh, lower level schools and no first and second level of schools will be there in the communities. And you like you make a plan which conflicts to the strategy of the educational reform developed by the Ministry of Education. Who do you address your question? The Minister of Region, obviously. Let me start then. Thank you for the question. I'm happy to see you here. I can answer it. It's very simple. <clears throat> and I talk about this all the time. India, we, not we actually, uh, the norms created these foundations for crystallizing this active layer of communities who want change. And of 900,000 heads of the communities that have gone through these trials of local elections and amalgamation, they deserve, because it was their decision, they've gone through that, they suffered through that, they survived through the battles with local administration. Someone may say they had battles with Minister Region, okay. But what, having created these communities, we have these facts and cases when not everyone is lucky enough to have this big cheese factory on their territory with due respect to Bashtanka. Not everyone is happy to be near the major highway and get gas stations along the way. Uh, a lot of uh, oblasts are heavily depopulated. <clears throat> and no one will argue that today, in the course of amalgamation, around half of the uh, local councils participated and they, they remained. And what do we do with the rest of 6,000? And we announced that uh, the next elections, according to the Constitution, should take place in October 2020, and they should be compulsory, and we cannot keep communities of 100 people of population. We cannot keep rayons of 8,000 where we have communities of 20,000. And uh, they do not cover the whole rayon. 
that the case of Bajtanka. So I'm not talking about the mot motivation and approach of different mayors because they have all sorts of motivations. And we have been hearing all the time that people do not hear one another and so on. <clears throat> so for the state, it's time to make the decision. And when our Polish colleague mentioned that uh, none of the countries did that voluntarily. None of so we have to activize that as a government, as a central government. Also, the rich communities, those who can retain schools, for example, good for you, but what shall we do with the communities that cannot retain schools? <clears throat> How do we uh, provide equal quality of education for all children of Ukraine. Yes, Ministry of Education have their concept and they will divest high schools. It makes sense. I know that in Germany they have this uh, uh, high schools, uh, lyceums, they are existing separately and you have option which high school to choose. You can choose like professional technical school or the one that helps you enroll with the university. Not everyone is supposed to be the professor. Okay, that's long run plan. And what do we do now? Like you are saying, nobody knows what would be the final goal of that. At the end, we are going to have all capable communities with pretty much similar level of services. When we are not forced to go elsewhere to get something which we require regularly. And with, and with uh, some of these services that are irregular, we can choose where to go to get those. And Regarding your comment on the framework of administrative reform, <clears throat> we based our considerations on thinking how to calculate the commitment of a mayor, how we calculate the activity of local citizens. And I am grateful to Barry. And in uh, two cohorts, they have, among the criteria, they have the level of participation in uh, uh, getting financing from all sorts of grants and governmental programs, which is an indication of commitment. But to measure it for the whole Ukraine and put it as a recommendation is quite hard. Number of projects, not necessarily. The total value of the projects, I don't know. The uh, level of participatory budgeting, some, some communities do have it, some don't. So we kept the criteria that can be uh, crystallized and retained and applied along the, the whole territory. <laughs> Our colleague from Bosman mentioned that they have this approach, like quality, of participation, some non-material criteria. That's going to be our next step. We amalgamated in 2016. In 2015, we had formed the model of perspective plan of amalgamation. And according to the model, uh, the rayon communities formed in a way that they were not capable because they used the criteria of school availability, a number of driving time to get there and the uh, space of the community. And when we sat down with uh, uh, our mayors, we uh, took the economic indicators as criteria of our capability and we fought for that. And we were able to form the community that is capable because the uh, indicators that we had, like uh, approach time and, and the rest, they didn't work. So we are happy that we did take that uh, one year 
to come up with uh, different indicators and apply those, and we never regretted about it. About the capabilities of the communities, among those main factors, uh, one, of, one of the main one is uh, staff availability, because there are communities that require accounting staff to make some basic calculations. On uh, Bashtanka cheese factory, I'm going to tell you that they existed in every rayon center, those cheese factories, but we just held our own cheese factory. Uh, we prevented them from uh, going bankrupt. We listened to them. And why all those other cheese factories broke down? Because they didn't have enough milk. And we uh, did a tremendous work. We collected milk from local farms, from small households. And we did the same to our uh, gardening plant. We helped them. We uh, helped them with our uh, resources to make them survive and viable. We have this fall practice in our oblast, trying to amalgamate uh, capable communities using some uh, political principles and break some of the capable communities. And uh, we should not let that happen. Regarding the uh, small communities, I know what it's like to amalgamate the communities. Those people who have gone through this hell, they know um, the, the smallest communities ask to be amalgamated with someone. But those who have potential, who have staff, you have to give them this opportunity to amalgamate and thus apply their right to be a capable community. And there is n no one single recipe. We have to use individual approach to every community and opportunities it has. Just one thing. Uh, my point was that I, when, when I think about the local government decentralization reform, I don't see the, the ultimate vision of what you want to achieve in terms of the, the shape of the system, okay? I have a, the, the idea, uh, ima uh, I, I, I can see that there are elections coming next year and you have this, you are convinced that you have to amalgamate all these communities before the elections because this is the constitutional requirement. But uh, there are many questions that you have not answered, like what about rions? What is the role? How do you want to uh, shape the system? And, the, and the, the size is not the, not the matter. In, in Poland, the smallest town is 625 inhabitants, okay, 625. And in different countries, they have different goals when they uh, promote the amalgamation reforms. In Greece, it was obvious they wanted to achieve uh, better efficiency because this, they, this is what they were told by the Troika, okay. In, uh, in Slovakia, for example, they have 3,000 communities for 5 million of population, and the average size is 826 people, okay? And they don't want to amalgamate because for them social capital, democracy, and historical reasons are more important, while the competences are very broad, I mean, the, as, as broad as, as in Poland. So I, want, I would just say that uh, one, one thing is to promote, I mean, to pursue the reform and to force the other, I mean, the, the rema remaining communities to amalgamate. But the other thing is, to, is to, uh, to answer yourself what kind of goals you want to achieve at, at the end. Okay? What, what is the, the direction the Ukraine decentralization is going to? Thank you. Thank you. You 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 are like you are led to have broader discussion today. So, well, we are discussing broader community. So stick stick to that topic. Okay, as far as the goals are concerned. 
Indeed, in uh, Slovakia they said we didn't need anything like that, and Czechs say the same. They say like 70,000 square kilometers, they have 6.5 thousand communities and they are doing fine. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I've got this information from the Ministry of Interior of Czech, and it, it works for them. But the problem is that it doesn't work for us. And the final goal is to have efficient government in every community. As of today, uh, it's not there in the most of our communities. We're happy that we have a lot of local councils with adequate management. Uh, who understand the functions, tasks, and authorities of local governments. They understand the European Charter, and they understand that they are the ones of whom the uh, lives of the communities depend. And uh, in mid-January, we got a letter from a newly amalgamated community, and they were asking for financing for their schools. It was actually early January, they just got amalgamated on the 25th of October. And they are like asking, can you possibly add some financing to our school? And I uh, asked them, what were you looking at when you were amalgamated? Have, had you had any idea that it's not going to work in this format? You, don't, you will be lacking funds to retain the school. And I shall remind, one third of the minimal average is of Ukraine. So we got this average, we got one third of that, and we make it a minimal criteria. If you have this approach, commitment, and awareness to make this change, that's the plus. But uh, again, these are the minimal criteria. Natalia Klučnik, EVP of um, the uh, Association of uh, Villages and Settlements. A short question to me in the, to me in the region. Uh, actually, I've uh, seen that uh, presentation for the first time, and it looks like I'm having this deja vu back uh, of uh, 2014, because you reflect the um, the methodology that was there before uh, the uh, territorial reform. And we were traveling along Ukraine, uh, talking to the communities, and trying to figure out how to make it right. And then everyone trusted us. Uh, and uh, they said, yes, we want to make it. And my specific question is how many communities participated in discussing this methodology. That's one thing, because currently I've uh, been receiving a number of letters from local communities who say, we don't want to connect to someone else. We want to remain capable ourselves. But according to your criteria, they have this high chance of getting connected to existing communities. Also, uh, if Uh, when, when you say you uh, follow this sequence of amalgamating the, around the uh, rayon centers and the biggest cities, don't you just repeat this pattern of one rayon, one community? Well, I didn't work there in 2014, but nevertheless, uh, no, it's not one rayon, one community, it's a different approach. Uh, the rayons comprise 60 kilometers across the territory, with a few exceptions. So the uh, circumstances are different. And in the law, unfortunately, I have to acknowledge that not all of the communities of those 159 that got amalgamated in 2016 could get that number of services. Indeed, the criteria are there, and there are industrial indicators on different areas. But if we read the budget law for 2019, 
we can see that a number of uh, communities do not retain the uh, financing, the functions of uh, the health care, and they are capable, and so on. So when we offer this criteria, uh, taking into account the experience and the current status of the communities, and when we encourage them <clears throat> to get closer to meet this criteria, I didn't have it in my presentation, but we keep explaining that, that the existing amalgamated communities, the, there is a noblest level city, just by, by its fact they have this authority. So they are the units that should draw the surrounding territories to themselves. But simultaneously there are territories who don't have any free space around them. And uh, the decisions will be based according to the discussions. And our specialists are traveling around to discuss uh, these. And we have this as a plan to travel all over to Ukraine and to be able to hear and discuss this criteria. This methodology and the criteria are not part of uh, norms and regulations. By the law, we are required to support the reform of decentralization by our methodology. So we give this uh, soil on which you can stand firmly and say what's right, what's wrong. So um, we encourage any feedback. We are running out of time, and this will be the last question. I would like to reflect on what I've heard here. We didn't have any effective local governance, so we had to do the reform to make them effective. And the territorial community is an element of local governance. And when you want all the local government system be efficient, you have to take care that every element of that is effective. And we start from the main function, uh, the, the, the main carrier of this function, the territorial community. And this is, you word it in like creating of a capable community. And we need to understand what, what is this capability and it's totally right wording. Like we have to identify what is the capable community, what are the indicators and how to make them be capable. And we can do it through the cooperation mechanism, and there is law on intermunicipal cooperation, but there is no uh, territorial subdivision involved. But when we want to administer the territorial subdivision, we have to uh, think differently. And we cannot say that let the communities amalgamate as they want. And only those amalgamate who f feel it's beneficial to them. And you cannot force the rest to do it. But the, the uh, task of the community is to increase the number of capable communities. Not just two or three, but all the communities should be capable. So it should be both ways, the carrot and that state enforcement mechanism. The, the state should force. Uh, the state defines what is the administrative and territorial unit. Who is the capable uh, territorial community? It is the community who is aware of its interests and is capable of implementing them, including providing services. If it's capable, it means that it should be capable economically, financially, infrastructurally, and uh, capable of further developing. And that's how we uh, come up with the indicators and evaluation, how to make it. 
and we are grateful to the ministry because since they started this effort, uh, they, they, at least something has been done because before that, no one dealt with this issue. Economic capability, this is what enables the community to function, not just jobs, not just uh, goods and services. It's mostly jobs to uh, keep people stay and work locally. And to say, like, we have this factory and we don't want to amalga amalgamate with someone else, it's not really a correct approach because you didn't pay uh, to make this factory. This factory might be there from the Soviet Union and the go government might have paid to finance the factory and, like, saying, you know, we have this factory in our community and we don't want to amalgamate because of that. It's not really ethical. Why you mentioned the number of people, the population? Because it, the, the, it's 70 percent of the revenues of uh, the income tax. Infrastructure, social engineering infrastructure, development infrastructure, you have to be able to provide the services that are delegated to you as a community. Engineering infrastructure as well. And you cannot and the weakness of uh, most of our communities is that when they uh, get these funds from the uh, regional development fund, they just patch holes. They do not build institutes that will provide for further development. Let's, we have to finish. And the same applies to the management staff for local governments and businesses. Because if community is not active, it will not develop. How to make this happen? There is a list of uh, the services, and we have to describe them to evaluate financially uh, the uh, cost of the service, like they did it in Kazakhstan, for example, and what finances are needed to provide that service. And then they just uh, describe it according, break, break it down according to the whole these areas. Thank you for uh, this fruitful cooperation. Let me remind you that uh, UCMC is available for you to have uh, all sorts of helpful discussions.